you have a relationship with someone and it's kind of conflict laden you know, and you think each time you have a conflict, you think should I be in this relationship? well, that's a big problem, because you actually don't know how much conflict should you have before you shouldn't be in a relationship? and the answer to that is well, you don't know now, there's actually some empirical work on the topic so I can give you a provisional answer, which is quite interesting so, there was a uh, research psychologist a while back, who I thought did a brilliant study, and they had couples record positive events, just qualitatively, how many positive interactions did you have with your partner during the day, versus how many negative interactions, I don't think they quantified the degree to which they were positive and negative, they're just going to assume that across multiple instances that would wash out, and what they found was, it's quite cool, they found that if you had fewer than five positive interactions to every negative interaction the relationship was going to collapse so now you can start counting and see if that's appropriate to you but the other thing they found, which I thought was really lovely, was that if you had more than eleven positive interactions to one negative interaction the relationship was also doomed and so, you think, you see, you understand that, right? You'd, everyone knows that, because if someone's wandering around treating you like a god or a goddess the first thing you're going to do is be just contemptuous of them and then completely bored you want the person to harass you a bit just so that you learn something, that's part of it so, but, so it's also evidence that there's actually someone there that you're interacting with, you know because if someone just does everything you want all the time, well, I mean, that might sound like an ideal fantasy, but you know perfectly well that if that ever happened, that's just, you're just going to get completely tired of that instantly. Plus, there's no, there's no life in the relationship, right? Which is a big issue. So, yes? But there's also two people who are both too afraid to pick a fight with one another. Right, right. It's arguably worse. <laughs> right, well, exactly. Well, the other thing, too, is you can be sure that in a relationship where there's no conflict, nothing is being decided because thought is conflict even if you do it by yourself you know, and so if, if there are two of you in a boat and you're trying to decide where you're going in the future it's not like that's self-evident there has to be some you have to have an opinion and your partner has to have an opinion and there's no reason at all to assume that those opinions either will be or should be the same and then, you know, you hope the relationship is solid enough so that it can withstand the tension of the conflict one of the things Jung said about marriage, which I thought was because Jung did a very nice job of trying to understand from a psychological perspective why in the world you should bother being married which is really a, a very interesting question you know, and one of, the things, one of the things he said was that you don't need to tie two things together if they'll just stay together of their own accord so the fact that marriage is a human universal, which it is, indicates that there is enough tension within intimate relationships cent cent centrifugal tension to blow them apart and some of that's just because people are different and they clash, but it's also because as you go through life in a single boat, you encounter huge waves and you know, you might get swamped, so it's a big problem his point was that the marriage vow was necessary because if your response to potential conflict was, I can leave you can't have the conflict you can't have the conflict you know, if, if, if on the other hand you're with someone and you think there's no bloody way I can get rid of you no matter what I do, short of murder I'm stuck with you for the next 30 years <laughs> then we better work this out and so that makes the he thought of that as a container within which a transformation could take place, it was an alchemical motif and that without that pressure, people weren't going to be sufficiently motivated to really hash out problems and, you know, you can think of that, think of that in whatever way you want, but I thought it was an absolutely brilliant observation in light of that, do you think that, do you think that divorce is too readily considered? I know that's kind of a tangential question, but like in well, the problem is, it doesn't solve, a pro it doesn't solve any problems, usually because, for a variety of reasons, and one is it's probably you and not your partner anyways, or at least there's a 50-50 chance and if it's you, you're just going to bring your stupidity to the next relationship and torture someone else to death mm -hmm. you know, so that's a big problem the next problem is, is that if you can't work out the bugs in this relationship why do you think you're going to be able to do it in the next relationship, especially now that you're older and more set in your ways 
The third is, well, you know, what about the kids? The fourth is, I don't know if you've ever seen people in a protracted custody battle. But if you want to ruin your life, that's a really good way of doing it. Because that'll take you out for about 15 years. And it'll cost you pretty much all your money. And it'll destroy your, your closest relationships. It'll also make it virtually impossible for you to be happy with the next person that you're with. Because they're going to be, you know, burdened by this absolute catastrophe that's surrounding you with regards to how you organize your interrelationships with the people that you love. So, so generally speaking, I don't think that it... I don't think that it usually solves the problem. Now, it, sometimes it does, but my sense is it's probably introduced more problems than it's solved. You know, so, I mean, one of the things you might note, for example, is that the only people who now get married are people who are relatively wealthy. You know, the fact that we've disrupted the structure of marriage as an institution since about 1965, say, what, that's meant, what that has meant is that it's, its benefits are now only available to people who are privileged. So you can look up the stats yourself, but if you're middle class and above, the divorce rates haven't moved much since the early 70s. If you're working class and below, it's a complete catastrophe. And what that's meant is that most, many children who are in rougher socioeconomic straits are being raised by a single person who is absolutely and 100% overwhelmed by their multiple commitments, right? Full-time responsibility for children and generally in employment in an extraordinarily dismal, low-paying, unstable and exploitative job. So, to me, if, you, if you're like you guys are, you're all going to be middle class or above in all likelihood. It's like, it's fine for you. It's not going to make a bloody bit of difference, all things considered. But for people who are poor, it's just been a catastrophe. So, okay. So, yes. Oh, well, there's all sorts of reasons. I mean, first of all, it's become socially acceptable, right? Divorce wasn't socially acceptable. And you can say, well, that's. That was pretty hard on people who wanted to get divorced. It's like, yeah, obviously. Any rule is hard on people that break it, but that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be rules. You know? Now, what rules there should be, that's a whole different issue. Um, out of wedlock, childbirth has become a norm. It was absolutely rare in the, 19, in the early 1960s, vanishingly rare. And that's become, it's, it's acceptable. Even though all the evidence suggests, like if you actually look at the evidence, it's absolutely clear that kids who have two parents do better than kids who have one. Now, you know, people, when you tell people that, they'll tell you an anecdote about someone they knew, maybe their own parent, who did a wonderful job of raising them as a single person. It's like, the anecdotes are irrelevant. What's relevant is the bulk of the evidence. Of course there are situations where people are better apart than together. And of course there are situations where one person can do a better job than two people who are at each other's throats. But it's, it's, aggregate, it's aggregate examples that you use when you're doing a scientific survey and the results of those surveys are crystal clear. You know, the other thing that's going to happen, it's going to happen very soon, is that there's going to be a very, 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 very large number of elderly people who are alone. And being elderly and alone, like no family, that is not something you want to look forward to. Especially when you start thinking that you're going to be elderly for like 40 years. So, you know, because say, say it starts around 65. I don't know how long you guys are going to live, but it's probably 95 is not an unreasonable estimate. And it might be longer than that. So, because, you know, we're adding about three months to the total lifespan every year. Right. That's the rate of technological improvement in relationship to overall mortality. So, you know, and that, the degree to which we're adding that extra lifespan is increasing each year. You know, and it may hit, get to the point where we're increasing lifespan a year every year. Now, I doubt it, because it'll, it'll probably be an asymptote. But it has been increasing for a very long period of time. So, you know, it's one thing to think about the maximization of day-to-day -day freedom when you're between, say, 15 and, and 40, 45. After that, that's a whole different story. And, but modern people never think about the last half of their life. You know, so why? I don't know.